talk last week on the subject of prayer. It's interesting. I just feel like, well, last week we had a, we had, oh, oh. It's interesting. Last week we had a we had a really good time of praise and worship. Today we have another good time of presence of God in praise and worship. And I believe that as we understand why we praise and worship, it gives us well, yes, it gives us a better understanding of it. But then it also becomes more powerful because we're we're functioning in that activity with an understanding of why we do that activity. Some people, and some churches, even I would say some leadership of churches often treat praise and worship as some activity that takes place simply to fill the time in before the pastor preaches. And so we, we sometimes, you know, we get in and it's like, well, we sing three songs and uh, we do all the different things so that we can you know, have 20 minutes before the pastor comes and preaches. And, and that is the, the, the obviously the, the wrong understanding of, of, well, it's a limited understanding of praise and worship, why we do it. And so I said last week that the, the vision of my heart for Cornerstone is that we would be a church that is a church of powerful praise and worship. And what I mean by powerful praise and worship is not simply, uh, you know, that it would be, uh, you know, known as far as exciting or, 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 or known because it's somehow, you know, you know, like some of the things out there, it's very famous or anything. I mean, powerful in the sense that the presence of God is resident in our praise and worship, Okay. I believe, and I have seen and, and even experienced myself, the life-transforming power of the Holy Spirit during times of praise and worship. Sometimes we think, well, it's just when the pastor preaches or when we pray for individuals. Well, no, God can move in praise and worship. In fact, God desires to move in praise and worship. And so I want to I want to kind of continue on that today and talk about, I guess you could say, some of the important uh, some of the important aspects of why we praise the Lord. What does praise accomplish? What does praise, especially what does praise accomplish? And uh, and, and just kind of look at that. So we're going to go through several scriptures. It's going to probably be up on the overhead as we're going through them. You can write them down. We have a lot of scriptures to go through, uh, but we'll we we'll start today. How many know our primary purpose is to glorify God? That's what you and I are created for. We are created for uh, to glorify God. And praise glorifies God. 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says, You were bought with a price. How many know you were bought? You're not your own. All right? That's what that means. If you're bought, you're, you're, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right? So our primary purpose is to glorify God. It's interesting. Psalm 86 and verse 12 says, I will give you thanks, or I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. There is an old chorus that we, we used to sing. Um, and, and might be pulled out one of these days, but it's a Psalm, Psalm 50, verse 23. It says there, Whosoever offers what? Praise what? Glorifies me. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. You could also put that in this way. Whoever sacrifices a thanks." Giving offering glorifies me and makes a way, and I will show him the salvation of God. The first thing I want us to see as we're talking about the fact that praise glorifies God is that praise is an offering or is a sacrifice that brings glory to God. God does not force us to praise him. 
okay? God does not force them, us to praise him. We present unto God an offering or a sacrifice of praise. Praise is to be something that proceeds from our heart that is surrendered to him with adoration, love, and thanksgiving, and, and a declaration of who he is. So we offer God a sacrifice. We offer God an offering of praise. And as we do, it gives him glory. It, it says that as we gauge in this offering, we glorify him. It is an activity that God is truly and properly elevated to a place of glory. It is an activity where he receives the honor and majesty that he is worthy of. How many of you know God is above all else? He's above all. And when we are praising him, we are recognizing or we're acknowledging God in, his high, in this highest place above all else and seeing him elevated to the place where, where only he can reside. And by the way, this is what the devil wanted, right? The devil said, I will ascend into heaven. I will take up my throne, and I will be like God. And only God qualifies to sit in that place. God is the only one deserving to be glorified. We may not realize it all the time, but even as we were doing it this morning, every time we sing a song, every time we lift our voices, every time we lift our hands, every time we, we speak of God's goodness, every time we dance. I was missing, I was missing Addie at the back today. They're, they're away on holidays a little bit. I was missing him at the back dancing last week. Every time we, 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 we do that, every time we speak of his goodness, we are offering an expression of praise that gives him and brings him glory. It's interesting that there's a promise that comes with this. The King James writes it this way, Whosoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him that order is conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. That phrase, orders his conversation aright, is not talking about necessarily what comes out of his mouth, but it, 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 I mean, it, it includes that, but it's actually an old uh, English term that talks about who orders his path or his journey of life correctly or in the right direction. And God says that as he does that, he will show this person his salvation. He will show or give this person his deliverance or his safety or his freedom. People think there is freedom outside of a relationship with God. They think that without God they can do whatever they want, and that is a good thing. People think that there's freedom in sin. But what people do not realize is that sin is actually a bondage of slavery which leads to death. Submission unto God, submission unto the ways of God, brings freedom, deliverance, safety, and leads unto life. And it's interesting that in this verse, God ties the offering of praise and the ordering of our lives together, and I believe there is a relationship between the two. Because I believe that praise being a sacrifice to God, acknowledging his supremacy, glorifying him can only genuinely come from one who is submitted to his ways. If you are yielded to him, praise will come. Praise will come. So the first thing, the first significant thing that we're talking about this week is that praise glorifies God. And you and I, in relationship with him, even outside of relationship, everybody was created to glorify him. That doesn't mean everybody does it. It's saying that's, our, that's one of our functions and purposes is to bring glory and honor to God. So praise glorifies God. A self, second significant thing that praise is, praise is a witness or it's a testimony. Psalm 40, verse 3 says, He has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. First of all, where does praise come from? 
huh? Our mouth. Okay, we'll get to that in a moment. So think on that a minute. But he says, he will put a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God. Many will see it and hear it and will trust in the Lord. We've talked many times when we've talked on the subject of faith that faith comes by hearing. So trust in God, we see in this verse, is stirred up in praise to him. Why? Because it glorifies him. It lifts him up. It puts the focus and attention upon him, and faith is built. I mean, we sang the song, the, one of the first songs this morning that we sang, actually it was the second song, Forever God is faithful. Forever God is good. I mean, how can you sit there and sing that song and not have faith built up in your heart because you're singing about the goodness and faithfulness of God? Right? Praise is important because it gives witness to those around about us, about, uh, around about you, of the goodness and might of God. It tells others what God has done for you. I mean, no, God's done some good things for you, right? So often we're focused on all the bad stuff, all the garbage, and, 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 and we don't tell of the good things that God has done. Now, it's interesting. Before this verse, in verse 3 of Psalm, where he says he put a new song, look, look at the verses before that, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock and established my steps. And then verse 3 says, And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God, and many will see it and fear and will trust the Lord. If you are saved this morning, if you are born again this morning, you have a testimony of praise that people around about you need to hear. People need to hear about the fact that at one point you were in a horrible pit. At one point you were in some miry clay. At one point you were on a pathway that was leading unto death. But now God has come in and has delivered you and saved you and set your feet upon a rock and established your steps. You know, we wonder why sometimes the world looks at the church and doesn't want to get saved. Well, it's because the church is complaining just as bad as the world. We have a testimony of praise that people need to hear, even in the context of this service, even in the context of the congregation. You know, sometimes people walk into a service and they're struggling. Have you ever been to church and struggling? Okay, And it's like you come to church, you're doing it, you know, in some sense you're doing it, if you want to say, a kind of obligation, but you know it's good for you. You know that you're, you're going to meet with God, but you're, I mean, you're just struggling because of circumstances of life. You know, sometimes it's important to understand that as we come into church and, and there are people maybe around about us that we do not know what's going on, but they're struggling. But our praise, our testimony, even the singing of the songs that we're singing and, and everything can be a witness or a testimony to the people around about us, even in the church of God's goodness, and they will see and trust in the Lord. So praise is a witness. Praise is a testimony that many see and will fear and will trust in God. Thirdly, this morning, praise is the fruit of our lips. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16 says, Through him, speaking of Jesus Christ, then let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise. Again, you see there the offering or the sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but new, do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. In Psalm 40, verse 3, we saw praise comes out from our mouth. Here the sacrifice of praise is called the fruit of our lips. Listen to me this morning. Listen intently. I realize 
we are of different makeups. And I mean by that, we are of different, you know, some of us are loud. Some of us wear our emotions on our sleeves. Some of us are quiet. Naturally, we're quiet, and our emotions are kept. I, I know God's made up a different different people different ways, okay? But I, I want us to understand this morning, praise cannot be just something that is in our heart. I, I've heard people say, well, I just praise the Lord in my heart. I'm just praising the Lord in my heart. And I'm thinking in my head, if there's praise in your heart, it needs to come out of your mouth. It needs to come out. It may not come out as loud as me. Okay. In fact, I'm a very quiet person. Really, honestly, I am. I'm a very quiet, reserved person. <laughs> I heard that, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> something happens when I get in preach mode or in, in the church <laughs> if, if it's there in your heart it's got to come out notice also that it's continual continually let us offer continually unto God the sacrifice of praise you know Back to, to back to the, the mouth, the words that we speak are important in the kingdom of God. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The Bible says, out of the, heart, of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I would say, and I would just encourage you this morning, this is going to sound maybe a little harsh, but just understand where I'm coming from. If we have nothing to say, if there's no praise or thanksgiving, it should reveal to us and expose to those around about us where our heart is at. Okay? When we praise God with our mouths, we are openly declaring our submission and our complete need and dependence on Him. You know why I'm, I just come to my head. You know why most people don't want to express it out of their mouths? Because they don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to be vulnerable. Vulnerable before people, vulnerable before God. Just a thought. I also think about this, to this. James 3 and 8 says this, No man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It says there no man can tame the tongue, but God can. I believe... I was just thinking about this. I believe praise is a spiritual activity that has the potential to change the way we speak, which will first and foremost glorify and honor God, but will also shape our lives. You know, we know the verse from Proverbs 18.21 that says death and life are in the power of the tongue. But the verse before that, Proverbs 18.20, says this, a man's stomach will be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips will he be filled. This is not talking about eating. Okay, this is not talking about sitting down at a table and eating. This has a direct relationship to the words that we speak. There's a direct relation to the results of life and the words we speak. And I promise you this morning, I promise you this morning, the more we give forth praise, the more we proclaim from, from our mouths the goodness of God, the greater fulfillment we will experience in life. I'm not saying you'll have no problems. Okay? I'm not saying that. But I am saying the more we give forth praise, the more we proclaim the goodness of God, the more that we are thankful before the Lord, the greater fulfillment in life we will experience. It is very difficult to declare the goodness of God and be distressed. It is very difficult to speak the praises of God and be worried. Just think about it. Give thanks to the Lord. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Forever God is faithful. And, you're wor and, and, and we're trying to worry on the same. It doesn't work. Okay? 
So praise is the fruit of our lips. Praise is the fruit of our lips. And I believe that as we sacrifice, to give the sacrifice of praise, it will, it, will, it will impact our lives. We sang it this morning. Praise is a garment for heaviness. Psalm 61, verses 1 to 3 says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Verse 3 is where the focus is. To preserve those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for, for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I put it this way, praise is a garment or it's a robe or it's a clothing that God has given us as a remedy for the spirit of heaviness or the spirit of darkness or weakness or feebleness. All of those things can be included in that word heaviness. I said it is very difficult to declare the goodness of God and be distressed. It is very difficult to speak the praises of God and be worried. Praise is a declaration of who God is, his goodness, his might, his power. Why, why is it so powerful in our lives? Because we turn our attention from our weakness and inability, and we turn our attention to his strength and ability. All of that comes because we have trusted in the one who was anointed of God to bring salvation to us, and that may be Jesus. You see, as we saw in the verses preceding verse 3, you may be poor, but Jesus is the good news. You may be brokenhearted, but Jesus is the healer. You may be in a place of captivity, but Jesus is the one who sets you free. We live in a world of mourning, amen? I mean, seriously, we live in a world of mourning, okay? People are mourning. You, you, we think of mourning as crying. Well, people are crying. People are distressed. People are anxious. People are looking at the world, and we're living in a world of mourning. We live in a world of heaviness. We live in a world of ashes. Yet God, through Jesus, offers us beauty, gladness, and a robe of praise, a robe of celebration. The outcome of this is interesting because he says there, I've given you all these things that you might be what? Called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord, that what? He might be glorified. The outcome is that we are made into trees of righteousness, planted and sustained by God himself. Why? So that he can receive the glory. Fact of the matter is, God doesn't want you just to get through life holding on to, you know, holding on to the rope to go to heaven, but, you know, just by barely holding on, just getting there. God wants you to, to be like a tree. Even in Psalm 1, verse 3, it says there, Blessed is the man who walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, but he delights in doing the laws of the Lord. If you look down in verse 3, it says, He will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in his season. His leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Many have taken this and taken it to some crazy extremes, but I want you to understand this morning that God wants to prosper you in this life. God wants you to see, be, see you sustained in this life. God wants you to see you walk in a place of victory in this life. God wants you to be a tree that cannot be moved in a world that is falling apart. 
Not so that you can receive honor and glory, but so that people can look at you and look and see and say, what's different about you? What do you have that I don't have? What do you got that I don't got? And I know that's not very good English. But so that people can see that you are standing strong, you are being sustained, you are being as a tree planted by the rivers of water. Your leaf does not wither, even in the most difficult, intense heat. Your leaf does not wither, and the things that you do prosper and go forward and are accomplished so that he can be glorified. Praise is a garment for heaviness. We're going to speak a little bit more this morning on that in, in, in just a few moments. But, but I would say to you today, if you are struggling with things in your life, if you're struggling with, uh, you know, anxiety, not having peace, if you're struggling with, you know, you're looking at the world and you're like, wow, what's going on? I would encourage you to get in and praise the Lord. Not just church on Sunday morning, but at home. You know, some of the things that I do when I get into my, into my prayer time is I just go before the Lord and I praise the Lord. First thing I do often is just sit and I give thanksgiving unto God and I give Him praise. And before long, the sights that I'm focusing on change from maybe the circumstances of life to Him. Another one, praise is a position of victory. When Israel went into battle, yes, they had their armies. <laughs> but if you really looked at it, every time they did the things that God told them to do, they never really had to use their armies. They had their weapons, but they also possessed a unique weapon. They had guitars, I don't know. They had instruments, and they had voices. When the children went into battle around the walls of Jericho, who did God send out? He sent out the army, sent out the men who could fight, but he also sent out and put in, in, in front, literally, the priests and those who could blow the horns and trumpets and who could declare the praises of God. And the Bible says that at the shouts of the people and the sound of the trumpets, the walls fell. There's another interesting story. An army comes against Judah. It's in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 21. We'll see, we'll see it there. But an army comes against Judah, and, and specifically King Jehoshaphat is there, and, and there's these instructions come. And in, in, in 2 Chronicles 20, 21, it says there, and he consulted with the people and then appointed singers for the Lord and those praising him in, in holy attire, as they went before those equipped for battle, for battle, saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. So what did he do? He sent out the worshipers. He sent out the praisers before those who were, he sent out them out before the army. We see the results in verse 22 and 23. When they began singing and praising, not when they pulled out their swords, not when they shot off the... I don't, I don't know if they had catapults, I'm just thinking. Probably not. Not when they pulled out the chariots and the horses and all that. When they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so they were defeated. Verse 23, then the Ammonites and the Moabites stood up against those dwelling from Mount Seir to destroy and finish them. Then when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, each man attacked, attacked his company to destroy each other. In other words, they went and just, they turned on each other. 
The praisers went forth. They sung praises unto God. God set ambushments against them. They destroyed themselves. Then in the all, in the, all of it came to the end. And, and those who were left standing turned on each other and killed each other. That sounds like a really good battle to be in if you're on the winning side. Psalm 106, verse 47 says this, Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto your holy name and to triumph in your praise. We triumph in giving praise unto God. And by the way, I've said it before, but triumph is not just barely winning. Judah triumphed over their enemies. They didn't lose one person, and every part, every enemy they had was destroyed. That's triumphing. When the children of Israel went through the Red Sea, and the armies of Egypt were wiped out, Israel triumphed. That's what triumphing is all about. We triumph in praising God. Triumph is the celebration of our victory. And you say, why does it happen that way? Some of the reasons is because our attention is upon him, not on our enemy. Another reason is because our dependence and strength is upon him. Thirdly, so that he can receive the glory. You see, God wants to come forward in our lives, not so that you can look at yourself or not so that I can look at myself and say, wow, look at what I've done. Look at how I've conquered this enemy. So, but so that we can turn and say, look, how, look at what he has done. Let's give him glory. Praise is a means of deliverance. This kind of ties into what, what I was saying uh, uh, a little bit earlier, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Praise is a means of deliverance. It brings God's supernatural intervention of, in our lives. Praise prepares the way for God to show his salvation. Acts 16, verse 25. It says there, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. That actually word, that, 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 that word listening should, be, should include uh, like listening intently. They weren't just hearing them. They were listening. They were listening intently to Paul and Silas sing hymns before the Lord. Psalm 34 verse 1 to 4 says this, I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord, and the humble will hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name to, together. I sought the Lord, and he heard or he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Many Christians are caught in their fears because they're focused on their fears and not on the Lord. And, and many Christians are caught in their fears because the problems that we face, rather than the praises of God, are continually in our mouths. We openly speak about their strength. We magnify and we make bigger these problems day after day, and we get overwhelmed with the fear. I, I, I'll add a note to this because, you know, let me just say this. I'm not saying that we ever pretend or deny the problems that were there. Paul and Silas were in jail. I don't think that they thought they were somewhere else. I don't think that they were denying where they were at. But in their prison, in their place of bondage, in their cell that they sat in, in the chains that they sat in, they boasted in the Lord. They magnified the Lord. They exalted the Lord. And, and it's interesting. They, at least I don't see it in Scripture, they didn't even look like they didn't even ask God to deliver them. 
It, it just says that they, they exalted the Lord. They sang hymns unto the Lord. So I don't know. I mean, maybe they did. I, I, I don't see it there in the, in the verse. But it says there, and the Lord delivered them. At the time when we feel like all natural hope is lost, that's when we, we should press in with praise and thanksgiving. Look at verse 26 out of Acts 16 there. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. That would have been something. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's shackles were loosed. I got to admit, that's a video I want to see when I get to heaven. It's so interesting. Paul and Silas are in jail. They're in prison. They're in shackles. They're singing hymns unto the Lord at midnight. Prisoners are listening intently to what's going on. And suddenly, God steps into the picture. Shakes the whole place down. Releases them. And sets them free. You know, that speaks really to... Back to that psalm. The psalm 34 says, My soul shall make its boast in the Lord, and the humble will hear of it and be glad. You know that word, the humble, they're speaking about the depressed, the needy, the poor, the one without hope will hear of it and be glad. Why will they be glad? Because they will see and realize there is hope and salvation for them as well. I said it already, our praise is the witness, our praise is the testimony. The world should see a church that is ignited in praise, talking about the salvation, talking about the hope, talking about the faith, talking about the strength, talking about the power of God in our lives, talking about what God can do for them. If God can do it for me, he can do it for you. If God has set me free, he can set you free. If God has delivered me, he can deliver you. If God has healed me, he can, do, he can heal you. Praise is a means of deliverance. Praise is spiritual warfare. Praise is spiritual warfare. Psalm 8 and verse 2 says, Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your babies. Or not your babies. Sorry. Ordained strength because of your enemies. To silence the enemy and the avenger. But what is that ordained strength? Jesus takes this verse and gives us the answer in the New Testament when he quotes this passage of Scripture. So remember, it says there, you have ordained strengths. Matthew 21 and verse 16. And said to him, do you hear what these, what these are saying? Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of children and infants you have perfected strength or perfected praise? Or the ordained strength of God's people is praise. It's no wonder the enemy doesn't want us to praise. It's no wonder that at times it can be difficult and it can be a struggle to praise. Because in the perfection of praise, there's ordained strength to overcome. Psalm 149, verse 5, it says there, Let the godly ones be joyful in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Why? Or continue that. Let the high praises of God be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hands. For what? To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with shackles of iron. To execute upon them the written judgment. This is honor for all his godly ones. Now, you and I are not fighting people. We are not fighting nations. We're not fighting kings. But you and I are warring every day in spiritual battles. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 and 12, our fight is not against what? 
flesh and blood. But it is against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. When we are involved in praise unto the Lord, we are involved in spiritual warfare. We may not understand it all. We may not see it all. We may not recognize it. We may not even uh, understand what is going on behind the scenes. But we are involved in spiritual warfare. It is interesting. It is interesting that, that King Saul was troubled with an evil spirit. In Psalm in 1 Samuel 16, verse 23, it says there, It happened that when the evil spirit from God came on Saul, David would take the lyre in his hand and play. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the sp evil spirit departed from him. We've seen it this morning through a couple of different things that we see that praise is a means of deliverance. We see that praise is a position of victory. We see that even praise is a garment for heaviness. Praise is a place and is an engagement in spiritual warfare. Praise is a pra place of strength for the God's people as we sing forth praise. Lastly, on this, and then we will get into uh, close with a little bit. Through praise, we teach the generations. Through praise, we teach the generations. Psalm 78 and verse 2 says this, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter insightful sayings of old, which we have heard and known what our fathers have told us. Look at this verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell the coming generation the praises of the Lord and his strength and the wonderful works that he has done. So when we're giving forth praises, we are showing forth his praise, his strength, his wonderful works, and we're to tell them to our children. We're to not to hide them from our children. We're commanded not to hide them from our kids. For he established a rule in Jacob, verse 5, and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children who are not yet born, who will arise and declare them to their children. Here's the positive result, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. As we show forth our praise, as we give forth and show forth his strength and his wonderful works, as we give this to the coming generations, as we give this to, to the generations of our children, we will see that they will then set their hope in God. They will not forget what God has done, and they will keep his commandments. I hate to say it, but I'm going to say it. I believe one of the reasons we see our children struggling today in churches, struggling in their faith, is because the church has not understood the power of praise and the power of declaring who God is. We have often taught or treated praise just like I say, a sing song, but we have not issued forth and sung the praises of God. We have not issued forth and sung about his strength and his wonderful works, even in our own lives as father and as parents. We have not given these things to our children, and our children have stood back and wondered where God is. Our children need to see us engaged in worship. Our children need to see us engaged in praise. You know, one of the things I do, especially with the girls, because they're, they're, at, they're, they're at that age, sometimes when I'm putting them to bed, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say, okay, we're going to sing now. And we just start singing. Now, they're trying to sing. I know they're off tune. I know that they don't got the words. I know that they're making noises. And, you know, I say, oh, now it's time to clap. And we clap. I said, now it's time. Let's lift our hands. And we lift our hands. 
and we're doing all this before, and they think it's all fun. They, they're laughing, and, but you know what? I'm doing it because I want to settle in their hearts praises unto the Lord. I want to teach them the goodness of God. I want to teach them, even at this age, the wonderful works of the Lord. It's interesting here. There's a positive result and there's a negative result. The, the positive result is that they may set their hope in God and not forget his works and keep his commandments. But verse 8, and they might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that, that did not set their heart steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Parents, we can communicate all the earthly knowledge and wisdom, which is important. I know that for, you know, operating and navigating the world that we live in. But let me tell you something. We should, we should make it a priority in our lives. We should make it a priority of this church to be a church of praise and worship so that our kids will know the praises of God. So that our kids will know that if they are struggling with something, they can, before, they can go before their God. Psalm 79 verse 13 says this. But we are your people, the sheep of your pasture, and will give you thanks forever and will declare your praise to all generations. And I... I get where that's coming from, but I, 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 I just say it's important. We, we, we need to make sure that the memory of the wonderful things that God has done will be passed down to future and distant generations. Every generation should be able to look up and see the previous generations offering praise to God, declaring His goodness, declaring His faithfulness, declaring His might and strength. I close off with this. When should we praise the Lord? Just a little little thing. Yeah, we we say you're right. Psalm 34, 1, I'll praise the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Psalm 145, verse 2 says this. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Psalm 22, verse 22 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Again, oh no. Copied the wrong verse. What does it say, brother? Psalm 22, 22. I will declare thy name unto thy, my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee? Praise unto the Lord. We glorify and honor God. Amen.